Welcome back to the second part of the RMBS model walkthrough. In this video, I'll talk about the floating interest component of the model and also touch on how some of the inputs can flow through the model. So to start off, I'm going to change the model to floating rate. Now the floating rate curve selected is the lowest interest curve. So we can see that the subordinate tranche is incurring substantial losses. And by substantial, I mean the entirety of the subordinate principle is left untouched. Let's jump into the waterfall and see exactly why that is. Going down to road 292, the time when the senior principal is paid down completely, you can see that the pool level cash flows are not great enough to pay down the interest balance, which is now nearly as high as our original principal balance. So since interest is paid down first, principal is never touched and the subordinate tranche gets the brunt of the effect of the lower interest rate. Think about it this way. Even though the model is using one month LIBOR to generate pool level cash flows, and the liabilities to ban repayment using that same one month LIBOR curve, our pool level cash flows are being reduced by defaults and prepayments, and the liability level cash flows demand a margin on top of that interest rate. So if the two rates are the exact same, the subordinate tranche uh, is gonna incur significant losses. Back to the control panel, remember that the weighted average fixed rate necessary to pay off the subordinate tranche completely was 6.43%. So if our asset level uh, pool is paying 2%, it's no wonder that we're not even touching subordinate principal yet. Okay, focusing on the interest rate inputs, you can see that there are five inputs worth mentioning. The margin, periodic cap, lifetime cap, lifetime floor, and rate reset frequency. Margin is straightforward. Whatever the interest rate is, floating or not floating, you tack on a margin and that is the interest rate the liabilities need to pay. So in the previous example, in row 292, the liability demanded, uh, ex excuse me, the subordinate structure demanded a 2.75% interest rate. So that is the 1.75% interest rate of LIBOR at that time, plus the 1% margin for a total of 2.75%. Next is the periodic cap. Let's say in period one, LIBOR was 3%, and then in period two, and all periods thereafter, LIBOR was 10%. A 1% cap means that every period, interest rates can only increase by, at most, 1%. So in period two, interest would be 4%. In period three, it would be 5%, etc., up until it would reach the 10%. Lifetime caps and floors are two sides of the same coin. The interest rate less margin can never decrease below the floor, and it can never increase over the cap. And finally, the trickiest part, the rate reset frequency. In that previous example, if our rate reset frequency were two instead of one, in period one, the interest rate would be 3% and it would stay 3% for the next period before increasing to 4% for the next two periods, then 5% for the next two periods, and so forth. All that is confusing to say the least, so I can show you how the interest rate inputs work in action. Let's go over that curves sheet. As you can see, LIBOR is 8.4% in period 1, 4% in period 20, and 3.4% in period 21. Going back to amortization, right off the bat, our interest rate is maxed out at 7%, which is the interest rate cap. And as you can see, in periods 20 and 21, our interest rate is 4% then 3.38%. But if I go back to the control panel and change frequency to 2, you'll see that the interest rate has a two period lag. If I change that rate reset frequency to 3, that lag increases to a three period lag. I can also change the periodic cap. Let's say I change it to 0.2%. Periods 35 through 37 are good examples. In the original curve, the rates increase substantially each period. But in the amortization schedule, the curve increases uh, at a rate of 0.2%, which is the cap. And furthermore, that cap is maintained over the frequency period. So it's a little bit tricky, um, but all those factors work together to set limits, which protect the underlying assets and also uh, which protect the liability holders.
You'll see that if I change the LIBOR curve from one month to three months, the subordinate balance and maturity halves to about 10 and a half million from uh, 20 million. That's logical. With higher interest rates, more principal is able to be paid down. And when I mean higher interest rates, I mean that the pool level assets are generating a higher return. The same logic applies when the six month LIBOR curve is selected. Now the floating rate nearly covers all of our subordinate principal. You may have noticed something odd in the senior and subordinate amortization graph when I selected three month LIBOR. The subordinate principal seems to lag a little after the senior tranche is paid down. It looks like that lag starts in period 220 and continues until period 260. Let's jump back into that waterfall to see what's going on. You can see that in the beginning periods, liabilities demand 9% interest rates. Now remember that our interest rates from the asset level, cash flows are capped at 7%. So there's no way that principal and interest are getting paid off. So in that case, our subordinate principal is accumulating unpaid interest. As you can see in period 230, our interest due balance is now nearly $7 million. So before any principal is paid, that subordinate interest has to be paid off completely. So that's the reason for the lag. The subordinate structure is paying off the unpaid interest before principal. Now back to the control panel, let's think about what's going on here. Resetting back to the fixed rate, we can see our subordinate balance is completely paid off. Let's hike up the prepayment stress up to 1.2. First off, senior interest drops by 3 million. That's because the principal is amortized at a faster rate. There's less time to make interest payments, and so therefore total interest decreases. At the same time, we're now incurring losses in the subordinate liability. There are simply fewer assets to pay off the subordinate structure. The same line of logic, just the inverse, is applied to losses. Here's how I think about the relationship between the subordinate balance at maturity and default. Right now, the model assumes a gross cumulative loss of 1% of those pool level assets. Let's increase that to 5%. Now you can see that the same subordinate balance principle is left over at maturity, but senior interest has only decreased by a few hundred thousand dollars. So defaults primarily impact the subordinate structure, whereas prepayments primarily affect the senior structure. There's a lot more to talk about here, but I think I touched on the most important aspects of this model. Like I said, the model could be more fleshed out, but it gives a good theoretical base for how structured finance models work and how those inputs um, can affect the different structures. One more thing that I want to touch on is this use of defaults. My understanding is that in RMBS, you're typically protected from default risk because those mortgages are insured. In any case, the model adds another level of complexity if default is added. Um, so it was included in any case. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it informative. Thank you.